Lord, come and use this time for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everyone. The reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verses 5 to 13. For when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was, because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And good morning, Grace. It is so good to be with you this morning and, uh, and such a privilege for us to be sharing God's word with you. And um, I just want to encourage you guys, if you're, if you're not already signed up, to come along to our Zoom coffee after the service this morning. Do join us. It's well worth it. And even if you're thinking this morning, well, I don't want to do it. I don't like it. You may just be the blessing that someone else needs today. You may be the encouragement someone else needs today. So do come. It's worth committing to. Um, you may have noticed in the, in the last couple of days, the Welsh Assembly Government have uh, said a couple of things about churches possibly being able to meet together again in the coming weeks. There's going to be some more information out about that uh, this coming week, so we'll keep you posted. It's highly unlikely we're going to be all together back in Hope anytime soon. But I hope in the coming months that there may well be opportunities for smaller gatherings like our Revive Groups um, and, and other smaller format events to happen. But we will let you know as soon as there's any information about that and we've had the chance to process it and, um, and think through it carefully. Well, <clears throat> this morning I want to talk about the daily battle in our lives to turn from the darkness to the light. The daily battle in our lives to turn from the world to God. The daily battle to turn from what seems attractive and yet is destructive to turn to the one who is beautiful above all things. To, th to think about genuine change this morning. Now, I, I don't know if, um, if there's a movie that comes to mind for you, but maybe there's a movie that you've watched 300 times before and you know exactly what's going to happen. The movie maybe that you know the, the words off by heart. You could repeat it better than the actors themselves. And that there's, maybe there's a moment in the movie that comes, and you know what's going to happen, but in your mind you're kind of mentally willing it not to happen. Have you got one of those? I was thinking of uh, the, the second Lord of the Rings film, where there's this moment where the, the, uh, the, the forces of Saruman are about to break into the walls of Helm's Deep. If you're not a Lord of the Rings geek, just bear with me. And these great bombs are placed under the walls. And there's this giant orc running with a torch to try and put it out. And everyone's trying to bring him down. Arrows are flying and, and it looks like he's going to fall. And you're just willing him, no, fall, don't get there, come on. Let it be different this time. Got one of those? It never is different. You, you know that, don't you? 
maybe for you it's like Titanic or something and you're just willing the ship not to sink and you're there watching and you're saying there's an iceberg ahead don't hit it what's your movie that you say that to that you're no don't do it again in your mind you can't change it can you but it's the same with us sometimes maybe you just get so fed up with things in your life that you can't change things to do with your own selfishness your own sin your own way maybe today you're watching and you're a christian and, and, and there are just habits that have grown in your life and you just want to be rid of them and yet somehow all the grief you seem to have known for them has never done anything maybe you've wept tears for your mistakes and your failures and it's never got you anywhere maybe you're watching this morning and you've never really placed your trust in christ and yet today you are carrying around with you a weight of guilt that you just don't know what to do with. well we just heard some incredible words from paul's second letter to the corinthians and we're just coming to the end of a little series corinthians kind of breaks here at the end of chapter seven and it starts a whole almost a whole separate letter and so we're just going to pause here but as you get to this point paul urges these Christians to know genuine change in their lives. How? Through repentance and faith. Now we're going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. But he starts off the whole of the chapter like this. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Paul says, since we have these promises. Now what's he talking about there? Paul wants these Christians to know that God himself has made epic, ground-shaking promises to these believers. They're kind of summed up in these few words he quoted in the last chapter. We saw them last week. I will be to you a father, and you shall be to me sons and daughters. Now, jumping into this new chapter, Paul's saying, since we've got these promises where God says he will be a father to your orphan children, since we've got these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement and thereby bring holiness to completion. <clears throat> now Paul's not saying we've got to make ourselves holy or deal with our own sin. Remember last week we talked about the great exchange where Christ takes our sin and we get his righteousness. There's this great swap going on where we are made pure and holy in the sight of God. <clears throat> so Paul isn't telling us to do that. That's already been done. He's saying now we get to bring that to fulfillment, to completion, in the power of God by daily believing in what Christ has done, turning to him from the world. That's the heart of repentance, really. Today, maybe in your life, there are some radical Christ-exalting decisions to be made. Well, Paul carries on. We heard these words just now, verse um, 4 down to verse 7. Paul talks a little bit of history. It uh, talks about his journey with the Corinthians and how this guy Titus, his co-worker, his colleague, his partner in the gospel, has eventually found him. Now, Paul had written another couple of letters before this one. And the last letter, as you know, had confronted these Christians over some massive issues of hypocrisy going on in the church ways that they were just utterly failing to follow christ they were children of light living in the darkness now these christians have obviously been pretty broken up about the letter that paul wrote to them i don't know if you've ever had that someone just in complete love pointing out something in your life that is wrong maybe some kind of destructive habit, and you didn't see it, but they did, and they've got the, the courage and the love to point it out. I wonder how you reacted. Often there's kind of this moment where there's pride, and you think, I don't want to hear that, you're wrong. And then as the dust settles, you start to realise, actually, you know what, they are right. We, we kind of don't like to be told in this age. We're, we're in the era where everyone's right, and no one gets to tell us how to live our lives, and yet, how often do we really need someone just to speak into our lives and tell us about our blind spots? Well, <clears throat> that's happened here. Paul wrote the letter. 
he's a bit concerned about how they're going to react. Like when you send a, an email or a message that maybe has got some difficult bits in it and you're just wondering how are they going to take this news. For Paul, he, he had to wait a while. There's no immediate email response to it. But eventually, in verse 6, he says, his co-worker Titus found him and broke the good news. And here it is, the Corinthian church has turned wholeheartedly and visibly to Jesus. The Bible calls that repentance and faith. If you don't want, know what that means, this morning it has the power to change your life. So that's the backstory. A letter is written, Paul isn't sure whether it's been well received. Titus finds Paul and says, here's the good news. And now I want to zoom into verse 8 and 9, where Paul really gets to the heart of transformation. Paul says, look at this in verse 8 and 9. Paul says in verse 9, I rejoice. I rejoice. Even though I made you grieve with my letter, I don't regret it. No, instead, I rejoice because your grief was worth it. Why? Well, he says the grief that these Christians felt at Paul's letter led to genuine repentance. It's almost like Paul's saying, I rejoice because you've been healed of the idolatry and the selfishness that gripped your hearts. I rejoice. Now, <clears throat> to turn from darkness to light, from wrong to right is never cheap. It always costs something, but the fruit is incomparable. So for Paul, even though he made these Christians grieve a little bit, their pride just was crushed for a moment. For some of them, they had to let go of some pretty significant things in their lives, and it felt painful and costly, yet Paul says, I rejoice. I don't regret it. Why? Look at verse 9. Because you felt a godly grief. And you suffered no loss. It's interesting Paul uses that word, isn't it? You felt a godly grief. How do you feel when you mess up? How do you feel when you sin? How do you feel when you get it wrong? How do you feel when you stuff up? Well, the Bible here gives you two options. One is worldly grief, one is godly grief. Now here's Christianity, here's what Jesus does. Paul writes to these guys, points out their guilt, their shame and their mess, which they were either oblivious to or in denial of. Now at first they don't like it, they're grieved, but the church isn't here to point out people's mistakes. If you've been in church and you felt it was all just about pointing out what's wrong with you, that's not the point at all. The church is here to lead people to the only one who can deal with our guilt problem. Paul says there's this kind of grief, a sorrow, a brokenness that is of God. Now I've met many Christians who felt bad about things they've done. Here's the thing, that isn't enough. It won't change you. If you're a Christian today and you think, well, I've made a mistake, but I felt bad for it, that's not going to change you. Feeling bad isn't the same as repentance. You see, some people have felt bad, but never truly repented. They've wept for it, but their tears have just been for themselves and the consequences of what they've done. Or because they're fed up, or they've had enough, or they've been found out. That's not repentance. That's worldly grief. It's a grief that is is merely there for temporary reasons. There's a worldly nurse about it. And here's why this is so significant for you today. That feeling of worldly grief and of guilt is utterly destructive. Maybe you've felt that. Maybe you've made a mistake. Maybe even in this past week you've made a mistake and you've felt bad for it. And it's been a kind of worldly grief. And, and it's just weighed down on you and crushed you. Do you know there's a massive link between mental health issues and feelings of guilt? For you, I speak to you today, here's the good news. Jesus didn't make, come to make good people guilty. Not at all. 
He came to bear guilty people's shame. Worldly grief is upset about the temporary consequences of my mistake. Godly grief is utterly different. If you want to know what godly grief is and how it can lead to true repentance and transformation in your life, remember this whole chapter is in the light of the fact that God has promised to be a father. That Jesus has promised to share his sonship with all of us. Now if you try and achieve change and transformation in your life apart from that, it will never come to anything. Here's how it casts a different light on our mistakes. I just want you to think for a moment, when, when the last time was that you made a mistake, that you just felt weighed down about, you felt grieved about, how did you look at it? How did you see it? Here's how this chapter should alter our perspective utterly. When you go against God, and when you take a path that you know isn't his path, and you make decisions that aren't his decisions, and you have thoughts or habits that aren't his, you are not breaking some cold, stone-written law. You're not offending some far-off deity. In fact, it's very little to do with rules, and Christianity never was. What you're doing is grieving a father's heart. That is sold out for you. And it's like Paul's words have enabled these Christians to feel God's heart. The word feel there is significant. Often as Christians we can be a little bit afraid of feelings because our faith is based on truth and feelings come and go. And, and yet Paul is saying no, there is a different kind of feeling that comes through the Spirit. A feeling of grief that allows us to capture the heart of God and know in that moment how he sees us and how he feels about us. Paul writes to these Corinthians and he says, you felt a godly grief, a sorrow according to God. Because here's the reality, we don't get how broken we are until we see it from God's perspective. It's kind of like this. You, I don't know if you remember playing on sports teams as a kid. And you, you kind of start off as a little one and you're the bottom of the pile and you maybe you, you get a bit taller and you, you grow out a bit and you're in a rugby club and that's helpful to be bigger rather than smaller sometimes. And, um, and, and then you, you kind of move up a club. You remember that? And you move up to the big boys. And all of a sudden you go from being the cream of the crop to the little nipper. And you thought you were big and strong and tough. Now you're with these guys who are three foot taller than you and look like giants. All of a sudden, your perspective utterly changes. I mean, completely. Here's the thing. When you glimpse the astounding love of a father for his wayward children, and when you grasp his great grief for our utter brokenness, it draws us in to see things from his perspective. It draws us in to see actually our brokenness is a far greater problem than we ever thought it was. You know, we, we tend to think of our mistakes, our sins, our failures as just like small little issues. Hey, they, it's okay, we're forgiven. But Paul speaks of a godly grief. A pain that God feels over our wanderings in the depths of his soul. In fact, it's the same, it's the same um, kind of word that Paul uses when he writes to the Ephesians and he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's the same word. What it means is that God himself feels sorrow and pain at our wanderings. God is not that distant deity you thought he was. He's not that far off schoolmaster. 
with his book of rules that you thought he was. He's the father that is broken by our brokenness, grieved by our wandering. And he's the son that is truly broken for our brokenness and made guilty for our guilt. And the spirit in us enables us to feel that same grief. That's what's going on here in verse 10. The godly grief, it's not something you can conjure up or make yourself feel. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit who is in us, who enables us to feel the grief of God over our sin. To look at the mistakes I made yesterday and just feel God's sorrow and his pain, not the pain of a rule book, but the pain of a father who cares about your yesterday and your tomorrow. A father who looks at your life and considers it precious, valuable, treasured. Who looks at you making that wrong decision and knows where it's going to lead to and is just broken by it. That's the gift of the Spirit in us. Convicting our souls and enabling us to feel what the Father feels. The problem is, of course, we kind of grow hard-hearted, don't we? Like when you watch a, a charity video on the TV, you know, you've, the sentimental music plays and, and they're raising money for some great cause. But the problem is you've seen it before, you've heard it before, you've ignored it before. Now it does nothing. It is just the same with the Spirit. When he speaks that whisper and says that's the wrong path. When he convicts your sin, you of your sin and he says that's the wrong choice. And you just kind of push him away saying, no, not today. I'm just doing my own thing today. You grow hard. Cold. You stop wondering about the immensity of the love of God. And that's what's happened to these Corinthians. And so Paul writes this letter, urges them, kind of like he just did, to make room in their hearts, to enlarge their hearts. And so now, by the time you get down to verse 8, 9 and 10, Paul is just overwhelmed with joy. That they've heard the word, they've felt grief, the grief of God for their sin. And now they've got to this place where they just hate what they were and they hate what they were doing. Maybe you know his hatred of what is wrong. Maybe today you look at the mistakes of yesterday and you say, I hate that. Look, that only comes by feeling God's grief for it through the Spirit. Well, I want to kind of start bringing things to um, a conclusion. And here's where Paul ends it all up in verse 10. Godly grief produces or leads to a repentance that leads to a salvation without regret. Godly grief leads to repentance. Repentance means a true turning, not just lip service, not some religious act, or being fed up or having had enough. It means a heart turning from what is wrong to God. It means owning my failures and mistakes and handing them to the one who has promised salvation through faith. We'll come back to that in a minute. But re repentance leads to salvation that is without regret. Let me reiterate that this morning. If you hear the word of God speaking today, and if you feel the grief of God over your sin and brokenness today, and you turn wholeheartedly, it will lead to no regrets. And that's always been the case. Whoever Jesus called and said, follow me, it would always be a case of there being no regrets, whatever they left behind. Whatever he calls you to leave behind today, there will be no regrets once you embrace him. Sure, you can carry on in your path and not repent. Maybe you, you say today, I, I will just lose too much by turning to Christ, by committing to him wholeheartedly. But Paul says, no, when you turn to him, there can be no regrets. Remember last week? You might lose the world, but you will possess everything. Paul says you will know salvation. You will know life itself. And when you turn from death to life, what is there to regret? But what is repentance? I mean, what really is it? 
Is it turning from really big thing, like you stole something and you need to repent of it? Is it the thing you do when you become a Christian? Well, it's kind of both of those things, I guess. Maybe today you think you hear the word repentance and you think, well, that's just for bad people. Or people who aren't yet Christian. Or people who aren't like me. Or other people. Well, I want to get this straight this morning because this is crucial for every single Christian on planet Earth. Repentance is far more about turning to God than turning from bad things. I mean, it is that, but it's more about who you're turning to. Just to, to illustrate that. I don't know if those of you who are watching and live in Portugal, I don't know if you've ever been in the toilets underneath the pavilion on the seafront. Hands up if you've been there. They're a little bit dark and depressing and smelly. Here's this experience you have. I, was, I went um, one evening, it was a little bit uh, kind of the sun was, was down a little bit low, go to the toilet, come up out of the dark, damp, dingy underground. And suddenly you walk up and what do you see? I mean, it's the best location in the world. You step out and all of a sudden the sea is before you. The red expanse of sky is before you. And it is stunning. The sunset, the beauty. Well, in that moment, what are you doing? Are you turning from the dark, dingy underground? Or are you turning to the light? Are you stepping out of the darkness or are you stepping into the light? Well, both are true, but one is greater. Both are true, but there's no real battle going on there. The light and the glory and the beauty is infinitely more attractive than the dark, smelly, damp underground. So yes, repentance is coming up out of the ground and out of the dark and out of misery and out of regret and out of guilt, but to what? It's coming to the infinitely magnetic and alluring, gracious beauty of God. He is better. That's why Paul frames this whole chapter since we have these promises. God is our father. So we turn from the broken temporary world and we turn to him, our hope and salvation. And to put it in the grand scheme of Corinthians, Paul says God shone into our hearts, that we might see his shining face, that we might gaze on the glory of the Lord and be transformed. Look, here's the story. How do I get changed? How does my life become transformed through repentance? How does that happen? Repentance is turning to see the incomparable beauty of the gracious face of Jesus Christ. And this is our daily battle, friends. For you and I as Christians, this is our daily battle to turn to him. <clears throat> Spurgeon said this, repentance grows as faith grows. And he carried on. Don't make any mistake about it. Repentance is not a thing of days or weeks. A temporary penance to be got over as fast as possible. No. It is the grace of a lifetime, like faith itself. God's little children repent, and so do the men and fathers. Repentance is the inseparable companion of faith. What he wants us to see is that every single moment of our lives is about repentance and faith. It's about turning from and turning to. And that kind of repentance isn't just for becoming a Christian. Honestly, our lives should be full of repentance and faith. Daily, hourly, minute by minute, turning to a loving Father, retelling the promises of God and aligning our hearts with them in the power of the Spirit. Today there is infinite joy in repentance and faith. You know, this. There's always a sense of sorrow about saying sorry, isn't there? If you hurt someone or offend someone and you say sorry to them, there's always just a weight of sorrow about it. And nothing you can really do other than say sorry. Look at our culture. We live in a, a cancel culture right now where if someone has done or does something wrong, 
they just get the book thrown at them and they're cancelled. But repentance and faith is different. Because with it comes this confident joy. That's why Paul rejoices. Because the Corinthians' godly grief, feeling the heart of God, has led to a turn. I want to tell you today there is one you can turn to who knows your heart, who is broken by your mistakes and failures, one who has carried your guilt and your shame, one who you can turn to today who knows your future. Today, do you want to know rest from your sin and freedom from your guilt? Do you want to know transformation for your heart? If so, then... Come to the cross. Come to the cross. See God's promises fulfilled. And hear them and believe them and receive them. Turn from what is dark to what is infinitely, beautifully bright. To the light of the gospel in the face of Christ. We're going to take a moment this morning to respond. And I want to do that just by having a moment of quiet to start with. That's kind of weird when we're doing this over the internet. It kind of means you're going to be sat quietly staring at a TV screen for a few moments, but that's okay. It's good to be quiet sometimes. Today, just as we bow our heads and take a moment of quietness, what's the battle you're facing? What's the battle you're facing? Well, I guarantee in some way the battle is about repentance and faith. It's about turning from the world and turning to God. It's about turning from sin and turning to the one who is holy. It's about stopping from trusting in yourself and your own righteousness and goodness and trusting in your saviour who is perfect. Today, if you will open up your hands and say, Jesus, I'm all yours. I let go of my guilt and my failures. Today, if you will do that, like Paul, I say there will be no regrets. Just joy. Maybe just as we have these moments of quiet, moments of peace, just allow the Spirit of God to enable you to see your failures from His perspective, to know how grieved He is by them, to know how much He loves you, to lead you into a place today of saying, I hate my sin, but my God, he has rescued me. So just in these moments of quiet, would you gather around the cross? Would you look to Calvary and see the face of Christ? See mercy itself. Turn to the one who is infinitely more beautiful than your shame. Turn to the hope that will last when everything else is gone. Turn to the joy that remains when you leave everything else behind. Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Turn your eyes to the hillside Where justice and mercy embrace There the sun
Son of God gave his life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the morning and see Christ the lion awake. What a glorious dawn, fear of death is gone. We carry his life in our lives. Jesus, to you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Yes, the things of earth will grow strangely. In the light of his glory and grace. I started today by saying it may be that this morning there are some costly decisions to be made in your life. Maybe for some of you this morning that means turning from certain things that have become preoccupations for you. Turning from idols that you're aware of in your life. Turning from habits or relationships that you know are just destructive. And it might mean that for some of you today, it means for the first time a wholehearted turn to Jesus. Look, today, I just want to say we've got to get this right. This isn't about turning because a law tells us to. This isn't about turning from something merely that's destructive. This is about turning to a God who has made such promises of love to you. Turning to a God who has loved you so deeply. A Father who gave His only Son for you. That you might become His beloved son or daughter. Today that happens by faith and faith alone. You don't have to be great. You don't have to bring your goodness to the table. You just come and trust in the goodness of the Son. Today we have amazing love to turn to. Today we have a Father whose heart is full of kindness. Who cares about your soul more than you do. Who is grieved by your sin and your failures. Not because they break some law, but because they are destructive to you. Because they're 
ruining who he made us to be. So we finish our time together this morning by singing of amazing love that welcomes us. We sing about the kindness of mercy. Here we go. Amazing love that welcomes me kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul and deserving we sing God you're so good God you're so good God Trust in Jesus today and to turn to Him and know that He is everything. Here we go. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Behold the cross. Behold the cross. Age to age. And hour by hour. The dead are raised. The sinner saved. The work of your
Father, we stand in awe of your sovereign, undeserved, overwhelming and overflowing love for us. That you loved us while we were still far from you. While we were powerless and guilty, you loved us. Thank you for your promises written in eternity. Promises to choose and save. Promises to love and free. Oh Lord, today we turn to you. Not just because you're a slightly better option than our guilt and our shame and our sin. But because God, you are beyond anything else in all of existence. You are the holy, holy, holy God. And we say today, Lord, have our hearts, have our worship. You, our God of grace, we turn to you from what is wrong. We turn to you from what is broken. And we place our hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe today, if that's the first time that that, Repentance has really meant something to you. Maybe it's the first time you've prayed that and, and it's, it's really just felt different for you today. You've felt something of God's grief for your sin. You've known a freedom through his spirit. If that's you, do get in touch. Do just send us a message and say, hey, it felt like today was real. Like something happened today and I kind of felt like those Corinthians who really, really turned. If that's you, do get in touch. Otherwise, we're about to finish our time together. Do stick around for our Zoom coffee. It's, um, it's always a great treat, so do be part of that this morning. Otherwise, God bless you. And a final word from Laura. Amen. Well, I've had a fabulous shield sent in. I don't know if you can see that, but well done, Bianca. We love that. She's put on there. Some of the things she's afraid of, like spiders and doing something wrong, being on her own. But then she's reminded herself that she's not on her own because the Lord is with her and he is her strength and her fortress. Well done, Bianca. Got another one here, uh, remembering that, uh, that God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth. We've got the new heaven there and God on his throne to remind us um, not to be afraid because God is with us and he's on his throne. So do pop your shields above your bed and remind yourself that God is with you. Um, just during the service, I had a message as Tom was speaking about repentance, just saying, but there's so many things I've done wrong, even this week, that I just am doing things wrong. And, you know, I feel it. I feel the things I do wrong. And just reminded me of a quote that Charles Spurgeon said. He said, there, are, there may be some sins of which a man cannot speak. You may be thinking, gosh, these things I've done wrong, I'm ashamed of them, I don't want to speak about them, I don't want to tell people about them. But he goes on and he says, but there is no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. Amen, isn't that good news? Whatever the things are that weigh heavy on you this morning, whatever the things are that you think, God, I've done all these things just this morning, just this, just this night, just this day, just this week, there is nothing that the blood of Jesus can't deal with. So shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you are so good. We thank you, Lord, that there is no end to your mercy. There's no end to your grace. There's no end to your forgiveness. And we thank you, Lord, that whatever the things that we are ashamed of, that we are thinking, I just wish I hadn't done that. We thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus is greater. And thank you, Lord, that it covers all of our sin and all of our mistakes. And that when we come to you, Jesus, you can wipe it all away. Thank you, Lord, that you are so good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, do have a great day, great week. Enjoy the sunshine this week. Please do join us for coffee. We would love to see you there now. Um, get in touch this week. We'd love to hear from you, hear what God's doing in your life, hear how things are. Do connect with us. But have a great day, great week. God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday.